Hello, and welcome to another edition of Kansas City Experience. I'm Sandy Woodson. KCX is a monthly program that pulls together a selection of segments featured on KCPT, Flatland, and 909 The Bridge. This month, we get some interesting tidbits from celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay. I know they're very territorial here between New York Strip and KC. Psst, it's the same f***ing steak. We take a look inside the gay and lesbian archive of Mid-America. These two aisles are all glamour material. And you don't see this level of response, usually, when um, you start a collecting initiative. It, it, they tend to grow much more slowly. We bring you a performance from the Wood Brothers, who stopped by 90.9 The Bridge recently, and shared a track from their new album that was just released this month. Hello, my little boy's hand feeling growing up so fast. And my father holds on to mine, I feel him shaking hands with time. And a little bit sweet, it's a little bit bitter. We also take you back in Kansas City history and dig into the story behind a photograph of the 1917 Stockyard Fire. The fire began early in the morning of October uh, 16th, 1917. We don't know who started the fire, but we do know that the cleanup took uh, weeks afterwards. But first, we hear from local filmmaker Tony Laddish and discuss his project about the 1953 Kansas City kidnapping that captivated the nation. In the afternoon of September 28th, the phone rings at the Greenleys' house, and Mrs. Greenleys gets on the phone, and the nun asks her how she's doing. How is her health? Mrs. Greenleys has no idea what this woman's talking about. This is the first moment when anybody realizes that Bobby has basically been kidnapped by a stranger from the school. My name's Anthony Laddish. I am a director and screenwriter here in Kansas City. About 18 years ago, I started researching a horrendous crime that happened in 1953, in the fall of 1953 in Kansas City, kidnapping and murder of Bobby Greenlease. The kidnappers were inept at best. Carl Hall was, I believe the term is ne'er-do-well. He was a, a fairly terrible human being. He robbed taxi cabs and he got caught and he got sent to the Missouri State Penitentiary. While he was in jail, he saw a news article about the Greenlease family. Robert Greenlease was a man who owned Cadillac dealerships, basically from Texas to the Dakotas, and he was filthy rich. Carl started hatching his plan right then and there to kidnap one of the Greenlease children and ransom the family for money. He just thought it was going to be a big score and he would be able to retire and that was going to be that American dream. He was, he was going after his piece of the American dream. Part of Carl's plan uh, included um, having an accomplice. He met this woman named Bonnie Brown Hetty. Carl saw in Bonnie uh, a person that he could manipulate and a person that he could draw into his plan to kidnap one of the Greenlease children. Uh, and at this point, he had decided on Bobby Greenlease uh, to be the subject uh, or the, the target for his crime. Carl and Bonnie had th this plan to kidnap this kid, ransom the family for $600,000. It was the largest ransom kidnapping in America at the time. The plan that Carl had come up with was for Bonnie, his accomplice, to uh, take a, a cab to Notre Dame Day on Day School, tell the nuns that she's a relative and that Bobby's mother has fallen sick and that she's been sent to collect Bobby. So she does this, she knocks on the door and the nun buys the story, goes to get Bobby. They walk out of the school hand in hand. While they're driving, they uh, are talking to Bobby and asking him all kinds of questions. What, what, you know, what's your sister's name? What's your pet's name? What kind of pet do you have? Oh, you have a parrot. Oh, you know, whatever. They're getting all these facts about his life that they would later use in ransom demands. They write a ransom note and they address it to the wrong house. So there's no, no response. And then finally, when they realize that they had sent to the wrong address, 
They send another ransom note and there's a series of phone calls. We want $600,000, we want it in um, non-sequential bills and they wanted it to come from uh, equally from each of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. They wanted, the, they wanted to source the money equally from, from the 12 different Federal Reserve Banks to make sure that it was gonna be harder to track the money when they started spending it. Everybody thinks Bobby's coming home. The ransom, the kidnappers got their money. When are they gonna tell us where Bobby is? When can we have our son back? And so there are reporters camped out on the hill outside the Greenleases house for days and days and days on end and uh, just waiting for word. They drive him out into uh, the Can a Kansas uh, wheat field uh, near a hedgerow, and they park the car, and Bonnie takes the dog for a walk, and Carl um, goes to the back of the car, um, and he and Bobby are sitting on the tailgate, and Carl reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out a length of rope that he intends to strangle the little boy with. And Carl was a drug addict and a drunk, and so was Bonnie. And they were really like they were too—they were far too drunk and drugged out to really live up to their criminal potential. So Carl uh, may, uh, cut the rope about a foot, 12 inches, which wasn't nearly enough for him to get a good grip on it uh, and to wrap it around the neck of this little child. And so he's trying to strangle the little boy, and the little boy is struggling. And Carl gets frustrated, and he reaches into his pocket and he grabs his gun and he smashes the boy in the face. Um, and then holds him down, puts the gun to his head, and pulls the trigger, and murders the little boy m less than an hour after he was kidnapped. They wrap the body up in a tarp, they drive back to St. Joe, and they bury Bobby's body in a grave that they had dug the night before. They knew that they were gonna murder the little boy, that was the plan, he was never gonna live, he was never making it home. They get the $600,000. They get in the car and they take a benzedrine booze-fueled trip across the state of Missouri on Highway 40 and they end up in St. Louis. Bonnie won't shut up the entire time. He becomes increasingly frustrated with her and when they get to St. Louis, they rent like a furnished weekly apartment. Bonnie passes out drunk and Carl leaves her with $2,500. After a series of bars and bottles and whatever else, he ends up in the cab of a guy named John Hager who works for the Ace Cab Company. John Hager, the cab driver, goes back to the cab company, goes to the dispatch, and he tells his boss, a guy named Joe Costello, I think I might have one of these Kansas City kidnappers in my car. This guy's got money. My girl that's there with him said he had trunks and bags full of money. Uh, he's spending it like crazy. He, you know, he sent me out to run all these errands. Joe Costello, not only is he the owner of Ace Cab Company, but he's also the head of a faction of the St. Louis mob. Joe Costello basically calls up uh, a, a crooked cop named Lieutenant Lou Shoulders, and Lou grabs a beat cop named Elmer Dolan, and they basically head out for the Coral Courts Motel. They arrest Carl. Carl instantaneously gives up Bonnie, just rats her out. Now the real trick of this whole thing is that when Shoulders and Dolan turn the money in to the evidence room, there in the police station, there's $293,000, not $600,000. So the eternal mystery of this has been what happened to $300,000 of missing ransom money. They're put on trial, they are found guilty, and they're sentenced to die under federal statutes. They're both gonna be executed. On December 18th, they're both brought into a gas chamber simultaneously, which is never done. They had to have a special gurney made so that they could both be executed at the same time. So a mere 83 days after the kidnapping, they're put to death. This family never recovered. Virginia uh, unmercifully lived into her 90s. She was never whole again, and it affected her the rest of her life. Every single child that grew up in this era knew the names Carl and Bonnie. They were the boogeyman. If I open a steakhouse in New York, my sirloin strip will be called a KC strip. End of f***ing story. Food on TV over the last decade has gone crazy um, because of the want and the will 
to eat better. And the thought, you know, 15 years ago when there was no primetime shows except on Food Network, we came to Fox 2004, our first show went out in 2005, and everyone was wondering, what the hell is Hell's Kitchen? What's going on there? And it was the first time you saw an unscripted drama unfolding, and that was the sort of boot camp scenario of running a restaurant on TV. Then the learning to do better, learning to cook better and to eat well uh, it doesn't need to be fancy. And so that boom with TV shows, whether it's cable or mainstream, uh, is entertaining but more educational. My first ever cooking show, uh, would you believe, was um, The Galloping Gourmet, a guy called Graham Kerr, and it was a Saturday morning thing. And so uh, I was playing soccer then, so I didn't really pay attention. The only person I paid attention to was my mum, because she was a cook, and she used to take me to work to sort of peel her spuds, clean the uh, fridge, uh, and then whatever food they didn't sell, we took home. I, I was a great eater. Mum taught us, you know, how to eat well um, and appreciate good food. So I, uh, I, I never really got into cooking until I had the upset in soccer. And then I went back to college and uh, at the age of 19, you know, focused to get into the industry and in many ways get away from the hurt of something that got taken away from me. And then it didn't really resonate properly until I was 22 when I was in the middle of France, thinking, this is incredible. I'm going to become French. I will refuse to speak English, I will learn you know, how to become bilingual and I'll put my head down and become French. I did just that. I, uh, I, we have vegetarian menus in all the restaurants and so um, that's a, a, a huge uh, notable difference in what's happening in the landscape. And yes, we can eat meat, uh, yes, we need to have meat-free Mondays fish Fridays, etc. So um, I listen to the customers, they vote with their feet. I said that earlier, and for me, adapting um, and being even more creative. I knew I had a void with my vegetarian cuisine uh, years ago, so I went and lived in India for a month and understood the amazing insight that vegetarian cuisine holds. So working in an ashram in southern Kerala and really getting up to speed with you know, braised chickpeas, uh, the most amazing vegetable curries. I loved every minute of it. So you'll see that sort of littered across these menus. The best music in any restaurants are your customers. And so I'll blend a music list over the atmosphere of the restaurant. Sometimes you walk into the restaurant, the music's too loud, it kills the atmosphere. And so it's something that we monitor every 30 minutes in our restaurants. And so the music sets the tone, the customers lift the atmosphere above the music and they will soften that music the later it goes. High octane, energized, not too loud to begin with and then build through the night. But you never allow the music to drown the atmosphere of a restaurant, super important. I think it sort of, it needs to be somewhat modern. It needs to be, you know, uh, a proper representation of what we're doing and something that's not overbearing in a way that it's a distraction. So when we first uh, opened our steakhouse seven years ago, we had a lot of sort of, you know, boomtown rats called Britannia. And so the playlist is, is work in motion. And I'll find out what the locals are listening to first before I just come in and put my playlist in there. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question because it's so fine tuned and it's a moving target. Oh my God, I was in Dallas uh, last month and I went to uh, say hi to Phil Collins and he was playing live. You know, that's the kind of guy I grew up with. And so, you know, whilst at college, uh, there, was, there was no one better. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could go Lady Gaga tomorrow night, Phil Collins the next night. So, um, and having five amazing kids, uh, they're the ones that are in charge with all my playlists. Because they just, they're in it. They know what's going on on a daily basis. Uh, Lil Nas X, Panini Head, you name it, I've got it on my phone. No, I'm not very good at music and cooking because I need to focus. If I'm in the gym, um, I'll train and the music will be absolutely up. And when it's high octane music, you work out harder. When it's sort of low and calm, then you don't put as much effort into it. My favorite kind of steak, it depends who I'm with. Because if I'm sat with my wife, I wouldn't be tucking into a massive tomahawk of 32 ounces and chewing on a bone looking like some caveman that hasn't eaten meat for four months. Um, so if I was with Tana or the kids, um, it would be a, a uh, a KC strip. I know they're very territorial here between New York strip and KC. Psst, it's the same steak. 
So, uh, yeah, I'd go for a bone-in ribeye. Lots of marbling, um, something that needs to be beautifully seared and then brushed with that uh, red wine butter at the end. If I open a steakhouse in New York, my sirloin strip will be called a KC strip. End of f***ing story. Um, you know, service is equally as important as the food. Um, we need that uh, charm. Food you could eat with your eyes closed and identify what you're eating. So we're not macerating and we're not losing that DNA profile of what it stands for. So um, I grew up with meat and two veg. I can definitely say now here in the Midwest, we are a glamorous meat and four veg. <laughs> My name is William Wheeler. I live just outside of Green Valley, Missouri. I'm a small farmer and raise cattle, and from time to time I go to the Kingsville Livestock Auction. And in their main hallway, going back to where they sell the cattle, uh, they have a large photograph that I, was, that I looked at, and it was a picture of the aftermath of a big fire in Kansas City at the stockyards in 1917. And the caption on the photo said that there were 12,000 head of cattle that died and 4,000 hogs. I got to thinking about that and I was curious, how did they handle that? How did they clean it up? That was in the days before bulldozers and I just wondered in that time frame, in that period of time, how did they handle that problem? I'm Bill Worley. I'm a professor of history at the uh, Metropolitan Community Colleges of Kansas City. The fire began early in the morning of October uh, 16th, 1917. We don't know who started the fire, but we do know that the cleanup took uh, weeks afterwards. Primarily, the cleanup was done by uh, horse and buggy hauling off the remains. As many of the animals as could be salvaged for meat purposes, and that had to be done extremely quickly, that was done, and there was some compensation that was obtained in that fashion. Most of the animals, uh, especially if they died in the conflagration, they were uh, simply hauled away and disposed of in the way that they would take care of dead animals anywhere at that time. The fire itself is the largest in terms of loss of animal life in the history of the stockyards, and one of the worst in the overall history of the city. But there was no loss of human life uh, in the fire, and that makes it a little more difficult to compare. Well, Bill, I hope that this answers your question, and I appreciate you raising it. Well, it does. Good. Satisfied my curiosity. Thank you That's very the much. Idea. Thank you. The glamour stuff is all down here. These two aisles are all glamour material. And you don't see this level of response, usually, when um, you start a collecting initiative. It, it, they tend to grow much more slowly. And this is the visual representation of the amazing response uh, on the part of the community, the mm -hmm. local community. This is one of the two volumes of scrapbooks that came to us from Spirit of Hope. Spirit of Hope MCC Church uh, housed the scrapbooks, these, these amazing scrapbooks that were put together by um, Phyllis Schaefer, who was the mother of Drew Schaefer, who founded the Phoenix Society, Kansas City's first gay and lesbian um, advocacy group. It's a collection of newspaper clippings, of other kinds of paper ephemera. So here's the, here's the headline from the Kansas City Star in 1978 when Harvey Milk was assassinated. Both the Times and the Star. A lot of stuff from around the church. So when there were commitment ceremonies at the church, she taped those in here. Just a wide range of stuff. She was a thrifty gal and reutilized these wallpaper sample books. And so not only is it an amazing historical record, but it is an incredible sculpture. It's really, really amazing. This banner, that was the banner that was in front of the Kansas City contingent that marched in the 1993 March on Washington. A woman from Iowa, Artie Veet, brought it to us. She was a photographer back in the day and she attended a lot of political events. Then she had this thing that was rolled up and I thought, well, I don't know what that is. And we unrolled it and literally I about wet myself because I didn't know anyone had this. Um, and the fact that it's autographed, 
by scores of individuals who were at the march or who were supporters of the folks who were at the march was incredible to me. I had no idea this thing existed. A collection that relates to both of these objects, actually, is this collection. This comes to us from Bill Todd and Art Bratt. They were both activists back in the late 80s, early 90s. They spearheaded the resurgence of Pride Festivals. Mr. Bratt, who was hilarious, by the way, was a scrapbooker, like Mrs. Schaefer. And when I went to visit him, he said, I think I've got something for you, let me take you upstairs. And so he showed me his workspace, and there was a bookshelf full of, of about 35 two-inch notebooks, full of this kind of stuff. Exactly what Mrs. Schaefer had done. Scrapbooks of newspaper articles, media coverage, in, in large part early on, on the AIDS crisis. And then as local and national media coverage expanded to include other facets of LGBT politics and life, he would clip that stuff and incorporate it into his scrapbooks. What's amazing is Mrs. Schaefer's scrapbooks start in the mid-60s and go up to the mid-80s. Mr. Bratt's scrapbooks start in 85 and he died in 2016. And so we have this incredible 50-year record of print media coverage of LGBT issues from these two incredible individuals. That's why I always come back to every, every piece, no matter how small, contributes to the overall story. And particularly in, in a community like this where we're trying to generate the documentation that tells our own history that has been ignored for eons. Song called Little Bit Sweet. Every time I go back home, brush the leaves off the stone. From the grave I see up the hill, same old tree stand there still. It's a little bit sweet, it's a little bit bitter. In my old bed I fall asleep and the spirits visit me. I wake up and I'm all alone, stuck inside my skin and bone. It's a little bit sweet, it's a little bit bitter. Bitter sweet, that's the way love is made. i 
o'clock, she looks in mine. Press out, mommy, I'm old and on. Then she blinks, the moment's gone. Then she blinks, the moment's gone. Bittersweet, that's the way love is made. Bittersweet, that's the way love is made.